I tested these old cameras against each other to see which one is the best, more than 10 years after each of them were manufactured. Now my Canon T3i is the first contender. Back in 2012 when this camera came out, I was delivering newspapers and I remember saving up for months in order to buy this thing. I used to film everything at ISO 100 since I'd learned that shooting with a high ISO tends to make the footage grainy. But after a lot of frustration, I realized that it's not as simple as that. For example, this footage was dark when I was filming, so I had to use color correction to brighten it up. Whereas this footage was bright to begin with, so in post, I actually made it a bit darker. Even though both shots were filmed at ISO 100 and have the same exposure after color correction, there's a big difference in how grainy the footage is. So to get the cleanest footage from this camera, you have to make sure that you shoot with a low ISO without making the footage too dark. And lenses are important to make sure that happens, but we'll talk more about that later. First, we need to introduce the next camera, the OG Blackmagic Pocket Camera. This 1080p cinema camera that also came out in 2012 captures surprisingly good footage, but it's a real pain to shoot with until you get used to its quirks. Just like the T3i, if you underexpose the footage, you'll get a pretty grainy image. So I usually go into the settings and configure the zebras to 100%. So now any areas of the image that are totally blown out white will have the zebra pattern on screen. So I'll usually set the exposure to be as bright as possible without any unwanted zebras. Now I've avoided a grainy shot, but it looks too bright on the monitor. So I'll just take a screen grab from a test shot and then darken it with CineD's free LUT builder tool. After loading my custom LUT onto the monitor, my footage now looks correctly exposed, even though it's actually overexposed. If you're shooting close-ups or footage with a blurry background, you can get through a whole day of filming without any issues. But then you go to shoot a wide shot or a certain fabric with a stripy texture and suddenly there's a big problem. This moiré pattern happened with all three cameras. It's a shame really because I think the average viewer might not really notice if footage is a bit soft or a bit grainy. But I think the kind of rainbow effect can actually be quite distracting for anyone who's watching. So I wanted to see if there's any way to solve this. I contacted the company Raw Light and asked if they'd let me try their anti-moiré filter for the pocket camera. This filter is almost as expensive as the camera itself, but I wanted to see how good the footage would look with this camera at its best. So here's a comparison between the pocket camera without the filter and with the filter. Looking closely, the branches look a lot better with the filter and the rooftop has improved, but there's definitely still a moiré pattern there. That rooftop is one of the most extreme examples I could find though. The vast majority of footage that I shoot has no problems at all or just the most subtle issue. Now I don't have moiré filters for the other two cameras. So when I'm shooting with those, I'll either just need to accept it or try to avoid filming anything with fine lines or stripes. Now I have to be honest with a camera like the T3i, the compressed 1080p footage is gonna look pretty murky with any lens. Just look at the difference between a kit lens from 1993 and a newer, more expensive lens from Canon's L series range. On this camera, they look about equal in terms of sharpness and detail. I know that's not everything you're paying for when you buy an expensive lens, but to me, it presents an opportunity to use cheap lenses without it making the footage look any worse. My favorites for the T3i are this tiny 24, along with the vintage 50mm 1.4 from Pentax, which you can find cheaply on eBay. And the faster, wider apertures on these lenses will give me more chances to shoot at low ISOs without underexposing the footage. With the pocket camera, I like to use a speed booster, which kind of simulates a larger sensor. But if you're going to spend that much money, you might as well put a decent lens on there as well. So that 50mm works nicely, but the lens I use most often is the image stabilized 24 to 70 f4. Now, one of the easiest ways to get the best footage out of an old camera is to improve the sound quality. Sound has such a strong subconscious effect on the overall quality of a piece of media. So just adding a simple microphone on top of the camera makes a big difference. Now Sennheiser have sponsored this video and they set me up with some microphones like this MKE 400, which pairs nicely with my T3i, a camera that's missing a headphones jack. So usually I wouldn't be able to monitor the audio at all, but with this mic, I can plug in some headphones to make sure it's sounding good. Plus I can turn up the levels on the mic so I can lower the levels in the camera, resulting in much less background hiss from the T3i's cheap preamps. Sound check, test, test, test. But if I'm using a really terrible camera like my first camera ever, there's nowhere to plug in a microphone. This is the cheapest option from JVC's 2010 lineup of camcorders. It's low res video quality and limited dynamic range definitely make it the underdog, but I have to admit there's something kind of appealing about the kind of retro look of the footage. And it's the smallest, lightest camera of the bunch and the only one that can zoom like this. 
So to try and compensate for the underwhelming video quality, we can use the MKE 600 plugged into an audio recorder, and then I just need to remember to clap so I can easily sync the sound with the video in post. Now straight out of the box, none of these cameras had very good battery life, and 10 years later, those batteries are even worse. So for the T3i, I got this cable that plugs into the battery compartment and has a USB cable, so you can power it for at least half a day using the cheap power banks that I use to charge my phone. The pocket camera's internal batteries are even worse than the T3i's, so I like to use this NPF battery plate, which can power the camera as well as a monitor. And since this is the only camera of the three that doesn't have a flip out screen, I think it's absolutely essential to use a monitor. And for the JVC camcorder, it's pretty self-contained. It has most everything you need, but I did get a spare battery that's larger than the one that comes with it. And that thing allows me to shoot for almost the whole day. Now, color grading the footage from these older cameras has taught me some new color grading techniques. So let's start with the pocket camera. I was filming in RAW, so I used these settings with highlight recovery on, and then I do a color space transform into Rec. 709. I'll adjust my color temperature and tint within the raw settings and then add a basic vignette. Next I'll drop the highlights down a bunch which makes the image look too flat until I boost the saturation. Then I'll add a tiny bit more contrast by lowering the shadows a touch and finish up with some film grain. Here's the original footage and the final result. For the camcorder footage I like to start with a the vignette as well, then drop the highlights down a bit and boost the saturation. This time I used the luma saturation curves to add more saturation to the darker areas of the image. For the camcorder footage, I like to blur it slightly to round off some of those harsh edges, and then I'll reduce the mid-tone detail to soften the image even further. After adding the same film grain as last time, here's what we started with and the final result. For the T3i footage, we've got another vignette and then I'll drop the highlights down a bunch, flattening out the contrast, which looks bad until I boost the saturation in the shadows. Then I thought I'd make a tint adjustment in the very first node to contrast with the green grass and of course some film grain. Here's the original footage and the final result. I'll just speed through one last example to match the T3i to the pocket camera. First is the vignette and then I follow the routine, just drop the highlights, tweak the temperature and tint, add a bunch of shadow saturation and some grain and now the T3i's footage looks much closer to the pocket camera's Cinema DNG RAW. So what have I learned from testing and comparing these cameras over the past few weeks? Well, I guess if you're looking for the smallest, lightest camera, then the camcorder wins every time. But you don't have to look closely to see the image quality issues. It has a real early 2000s home video look, which might be nice for a certain project, but probably wouldn't make sense for most things. The Canon T3i served me well for many years, and I still have a fondness for it, but I do think the Moray issue is pretty significant. So it's hardly surprising that my favourite camera for the kind of stuff I shoot is the pocket camera. Filming with any old camera comes with some sacrifices and the pocket camera, it's not even really that much cheaper than a modern camera. But I don't know, filming with these cameras so much over the past few weeks, I do think there's something nice about preserving an old camera rather than just throwing it out and replacing it every couple of years. I guess my default position is to try and optimise everything about a camera, so get the least grain, the most clarity, battery to last the longest but some of these things are a little bit overkill I think. So next time I'm thinking about a new camera I'm going to come back to this video that was filmed exclusively with cameras from 10 years ago and maybe I'll remember to be grateful for the cameras that I already have. I'd like to say thanks to Sennheiser for sponsoring this video. At the time of recording they have a deal going where if you order a MKE 600 you get one of these for free. And Sennheiser also asked me to tell you about their festive gift guide that includes the microphones and headphones that I've been using throughout this video and a few more. So do click the link in the description if you're interested in that. But otherwise, my name's Simon Cade, this has been DSLR Guide, and I'll see you next time.